Well, it is all going on out there. The stress between engineers and drivers and teams in decision-making land. There's tyres being changed on most of the cars. There's being suspension and tweaks done to sway bars and making sure that the cars are more like a wet car. You've just come back into the com box. You are soaked, Neil Crompton. It, it, it's cold and windy down there. Actually, I would love to stay down there. I love it when there's a theatre of war down there because it is on. People are adjusting cars. They're changing tyres. They're thinking about what they can do. They're diving underneath them as quick as they dare to try and make a couple of quick changes to damp as if they can to loosen up these cars. But looking out at the moment to the northwest. It's actually clear out there, but the wind is swirling around. I made the point on the grid, Scafi, that it's wild and weird out there at the moment. But behind us, in a southerly direction, it is as black as the ace of spades. And we say all the time, if you want great supercar action, just add water. Check the wind, and the front that's come across from the west is unbelievable. That cell that got you... It looks like there's another piece behind it. We've been looking at the radar while you were down there getting soaked, which was actually quite funny. But... Whilst we were doing it, we think that it's coming in at between 60 and 70 kilometres an hour. It, it is really coming. It was a full wind tunnel a test down there on Pitt Strait. It was crazy windy, so the squall went through. Now, there's also a bit of chat going on in the background at the moment that because there's some oil on the racetrack, this may even get underway behind the safety car for safety reasons, obviously, for everybody to acclimatise to the situation. So we'll keep you updated on that as we get more information from... Motorsport Australia race control and obviously this is what happened if you're only just sitting down and joining the coverage earlier in the day we had a terrible incident involving Thomas Randall and Andre Heimgartner a start line incident they're a rarity thankfully in supercar racing and motorsport generally but we had a very big nose to tail impact both drivers okay but both cars very second hand uh, absolutely personnel, some of the biggest damage signal, I've seen on the signal. cars for control a long time to all personnel race 23 will be a safety car start I repeat race 23 will be a safety car start James Taylor. And Motorsport Australia Race Control making that determination because of the oil that's in front of Cam Waters' car. So the reality is we saw in the previous start there was already a, an impact, but once you put water on that, that will be like absolute ice. So that's the reason. Let's have a look at our Pizza Hut trap. Mate. And we love this place. We've been talking about it all weekend, about the complexity of the layout and how it has so much of the deviation from slow to fast to elevation change. And the unforced errors are a really big part of this story. It's 4.95 Ks, it's 18 turns, and it's got the rise and fall that trips you up. When you get to the corner, the road falls away from you. When you go to turn the wheel, and this is now going to be a situation around it being wet, when you go to turn the wheel, often the grip level changes because of the wind direction and the way that the cars all weekend have been dealing with a really strong northerly. We're looking at the flags out there right now. The wind direction is completely different and the way the cars are going to buff it around will be a big part of this afternoon. Cam Waters, what a weekend he's had in terms of qualifying. On pole position, Croppo, alongside Anton Di Pasquale. How fast have those Mustangs been? They've been very strong. Brock Feeney together with Shane Van Gisbergen. They'll start on row number two. James Courtney and Will Brown. It was good to catch up with those guys. They'll duke it out all the way to the first corner in behind that safety car as we walk through the detail before. Zach Best and Chas Moss. It's been an impressive weekend for Zach Best. One of the two wild cards in the field this weekend and generated an armoral pole in the process. It's been a fighting comeback weekend for Will Davison. Did an awesome job, particularly yesterday. Tough one for him in that earlier race today. Mark Winterbottom and Lee Holdsworth. Lee was unfortunately penalised in the previous race. And a penalty also for Brody Kostecki. Had some troubles after contact and a flat tyre. James Golding in the subway entry. Nick Perkett been a difficult weekend for him as well together with Jack LeBrock out of positions 15 and 16. Look at the shine in the background on that racetrack. Jake Kostecki and Todd Hazelwood out of 17 and 18. Jordan Boys, the second of the young wildcard entries. Scott Pye celebrating 300 supercar races this weekend based on his start earlier this morning. Jack Smith and Macaulay Jones in the SCT Logistics and TRG Transport entries for Brad Jones Racing. Chris Pitha for Coca-Cola. Tim Slade in the Cool Drive entry down in 24th position 
further afield behind these guys with David Reynolds. And David had some qualifying gremlins in this car. It didn't have lock lights or shift lights in that qualifying yeah. session. His race pace, he's happy with, but qualifying clearly uh, something of a disaster. So when those little tools that I spoke about in the previous race are missing from your repertoire when you're trying Control to put together the perfect lap, it's very damaging. Safety car proceed. So they'll be in behind the BP Ultimate Safety Car. You can hear James Taylor in the background just walking everybody through the detail on the race management channel. There is the Mustang at the front of the field. Mark, any time that we see the mirror shine on the racetrack, you want to be on a wet. They'll all be on wet, so they'll have the high-intensity rain light switched on as a result of it at the rear of the car. But it will be like ice out there because it means there's a film of water on top of the asphalt. And I'm almost certain of the fact that in the first couple of laps there'll be some crazy chaos because you just will not know the grip level, but you're compelled, you're paid to go fast, to pass people. Story so far... Well, we've had a cold, cold, blustery weekend here, but so far a couple of dry races. So Shane Van Gisbergen got the job done yesterday. He got home by 2.2 seconds and he got bonus points for the fastest lap. Race number two, earlier on in the day, Thomas Randall from the front row of the grid stalls it, damages the clutch and takes a huge impact from behind. Andre Heimgartner slamming into that car and it was an aeroplane crash. Bits in every direction. Fortunately, the drivers are okay. Nick Perkat was tangled up in that as well. But Van Gisbergen pressed on, consistent, fast, stretched it out one more time. 2.5 seconds the gap at the end of it. And he got the bonus points one more time. So far, Shane Van Gisbergen's prevailed this weekend. 350 odd points clear of the rest of the field. He is in fine shape. 354, in fact, is the modern number. But uh, I am very glad, Garth Tander, that Mark and I are in the commentary box and that you're down there soaking up that water, brother. I can tell you for free, it's still raining down here. And... Just have a think about the 27 drivers that are about to take the start for this one. Not one lap in wet conditions leading up to this race. Yes, we raced here in the rain here last year, but the track's rubbered in this year. We've had lot, two days of dry running. The track's going to be very different to the track they raced on in the wet last year. So how do you make a difference? The drivers that can feel the grip level can understand the car that they have underneath them and, uh, and make the most of the grip that they have in those first four, four or five laps. You can come from deep in the field and make a big difference to how your race will play out early in this one. Thank you, Garth. And there's wet tracks and then there's wet tracks. And when we ran here on the Saturday last year, it was damp, but it wasn't wet like this is. So when you see the plume from the back of the cars of those Dunlop wet tyres channelling and throwing up that water behind, which is picked up and thrown further afield by those rear wings on the car, you know that it's pretty heavy wet. And if you're down the order, one of the things that does happen here, if you're in the first group of cars, the vision bonus that you get it's massive. is massive. So you just, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what the adjustments are on the car. Yeah, you, you can't see. You can't see. <laughs> so you might have the demon tweak going with springs and dampers and ride heights and wings and every other thing. Tire pressures is another thing that's critical to their performance in these conditions. But if you can't see, good luck, bro. Exactly. So two major things. This race has actually commenced. So they've already, behind the safety car, started the race effectively. Now, the reason they're going to park for a couple of extra laps, they're going to call them sighting laps, because the Dunlop wet tyre, when it's produced, we might see if we can just find a, a little bit of vision to, to pick this up. But when they come out of the mould when they're made, they're shiny. They've got mould release on them. And they've effectively got a shiny surface that needs to be worn off slightly before they're properly in the groove to race. So you've got a slippery surface that you've just recounted. You've also got water that we've never seen really at the moment. Next part is you've got slippery tyres with the mould releases. Tim Edwards contemplates life with Cam Waters leading the field away. And then you've also got the issue of what your car is like because all weekend as a dry car, you run them stiff and low and hard. It, that, that is the worst thing you can possibly have for a wet weather car. <laughs> but, but great for a television audience. <laughs> Scafie, yeah, right on cue, mate. They're just pressuring tyres now. You can see there what Scafie's talking about. That is shiny and that is slippery. Now, the other big game in town is pressures. You can see these guys doing pressures. Now, when it's really wet like this and it's puddling on the ground, you want plenty of pressure because you want to open up 
that gap that pumps the water out nice and big and it's not bad to sometimes put a bit of crowning on the tyre so you can make it work hard and generate some heat. Now if it starts to dry out and we get a dry racing line you don't want that pressure in you in there you want the pressure out so that's the balance you've got to find very difficult. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And that's why I mentioned tyre pressure, because of all the things you can play with right now. It's probably got the greatest influence of any of the very few things that you can adjust in this situation. Race control again. And James Taylor, together with Craig Baird in the background, the driving standards advisor, they're administering a large group of people there. In fact, right next to us, where we're broadcasting from at the moment, and they've got a very high-tech race control centre there with giant screens. They also see things that we don't see and uh, they obviously analyse data and pictures as well that they get from the cars, and there's a shot. Control tool, safety car, lights out at 13.5. Return to pit lane this way, please. So that's on the race management channel that everybody up and down the pit lane is tuned to, so all of the crew chiefs, team managers, team owners, they're onto that, the engineers are onto it, and they'll advise the drivers of the situation. So they're all working pretty hard out there at the moment to try and channel some water where they can to try and create something of a groove. And they've now got something of a feel for the way in which these cars are behaving, but they're doing it at walking pace. So when they actually get stuck into it, things will be very different. So what will these cars be like and how bold do you want to be? Now also, one of the key points here, there will still be the compulsory stop that we've been speaking about. So they still go through the same procedures and process that you would normally do when it alteration, comes to dealing... Alteration, Please extinguish lights at turn 12 to give you more time to come in. Lights out at turn 12, please. Right there. That's right. turn 12. So they still have to get on another set of tyres, and that's why Larco was able to get down there before and show you how shiny those tyres were, and some of them won't be roaded. Take note. And they'll be messing around with the tyre pressures on those as well. But that is scary slippery looking out there at the moment <laughs> it is scary slippery that's a very good explanation the next part that's wild is when you do the cps that you've just made the point about you probably have to do it early to get yourself out of the train because the visibility is the issue i reckon there'd be a lot to be said today for fresh air running yep you know, as to get the best visibility, which will be, that's almost a silly statement because visibility would be terrible even on your own. Yeah. But the best possible visibility. But the other thing, and we've all seen it, especially the greybeards in the game, sometimes if it stays heavy, wet like this, and I reckon and it's I going to for the race, the longer you're out there on the wets, the more heat you generate and the more you find the groove. And you actually, it's a mental groove as well as just what's going on technically with the car. Yep. So I wouldn't want to push that stop too late because then we have to deal with cold tyres that are shiny at the back end of the race. No thanks. That doesn't sound like a heap of fun. No, exactly. And the tram tracks will be the keys at the start. So the lead car will have the tram track. You need to park your car in that groove. Green flag here, green flag. It's going to get exciting here, folks. Don't go away because we have got a heavy wet track at the bend. Off the pole position, Cam Waters tippy-toeing, trying to get 650 horsepower to connect to the road. And now we get under green flag racing. And imagine what life looks like when you're about 10 cars back. It's a brownout on the screen. You cannot see. And look in the background at just how terrible that is. And the cars still reach well north of 250 odd kilometres an hour in these conditions. Turn one, where do you brake? Who's around you? How aggressive do you lean on the car under brakes and through the right hander at turn one? They've actually done a very good job as a group to be able to get through there. Brody Kostecki's made one spot. He's come up to 12. It's still Waters over Dick Pasquale and Van Gisbergen and as they tippy-toe. They try and find where the grip is. They'll be short-shifting between the low and the higher gears to try and look after and manage the wheel spin as much as they can. And you do not want to lock a brake, so they've got more rear brake bias going here at the moment. You don't want the fronts locked because then you can't steer and turn the car. Here comes Shane Van Gisbergen. He relishes this stuff. He made a comment at a wet Sydney Motorsport Park earlier how much he was enjoying driving in these atrocious conditions. He's got amazing skill. Recently done some very successful rallying in New Zealand as well. Water's slithering all over the place. It's a river of water out there at the moment. And this man used to be very good at it, Jamie Winkup. He'll be looking at his two charges. Now, Brock Fernie's trying the outside go-kart line because we spoke about the circuit rubbering up. Where you get rubber on the racing line down the inside. 
Anton gets it done. This is turn 13. Right around the outside is Van Gisberg. And who was disappearing off the road? That was Courtney, wasn't it? They were almost three wide at one point there in the right-hander at 13. Di Pasquale under the attack at the moment. Waters clutching to the lead. He's back in it once more. Van Gisbergen gets up. Brock Feeney having a huge lunge down the inside. And Anton checked up. He's really having trouble getting these tyres to connect at the moment. Waters is under assault. He dives to the right. The crisscross is on from Van Gisbergen. He covers. Look at Feeney down the inside, battling for third. You need to look in every direction at the moment. Now, is there a change for the lead? Does Van Gisbergen get up the inside? Yes, but does he carry too much speed into that final corner? Yes. The crisscross coming out the other side now for Waters. Here we go. It's a drag race down the front straight. Waters comes back one more time. This is remarkable skill, folks. These are the best drivers of these sorts of cars in the world. Have not driven in the wet all weekend. Have not even thought about how wild these conditions are. Can't see, and they are turning it on. This is fantastic. And giving each other racing room when you can barely see where you're going yourself, let alone affording somebody some space on the outside. Waters on top one more time. Feeney, deepest, I beg your pardon, Van Gisberg, and then Feeney, then Deepa Squally. Anton looked like he was really battling. Check it out. This is what it looks like from Brock's car. And if you're further back in that pack, it's just shocking. So if you go back to 15, they're 10 seconds behind. Yeah, already. And that's largely due to a lack of visibility. Yep. Here we go again. It's a carbon copy. One more time, we've got Van Gisbergen trying to get power to the ground. This is what it looks like from onboard Shane's car. Gee, that was close. Who's that? Van Gisbergen. He's saying, I'll let him go. I can't see anything out in the rear view mirror. He knows that Brock's lurking, but he's got no idea where. It ends up being a case of Braille sometimes. You can literally feel the other car bumping into the rear bumper and down the side. So he has another nibble down the inside here. High-intensity rain lights are the only thing you can sometimes see when you're in the following car. Waters covers. Van Gisbergen a little bit higher and wider. It looks like there's some pace coming again now to Anton Di Pasquale's car. I reckon those tyres didn't come up for the first lap or two, Mark. Absolutely. So there'll be some disparity in what the teams decided to do regarding the initial tyre pressures and therefore when they stop. So how you get the pressure and temperature to build up when the conditions are like this, almost impossible. The other thing that's a big factor, and it's, and it's spooky brave, is that you, if you're right behind the car in front, you're OK, because you're in the aero wash, just like that, you can see. But if you're back one car length, you can't see. So getting out of the plume is what Mark's talking about there out of that final corner at 18. The shift lights are illuminating. So he sits in behind the rear wing. He'll have a think about pulling out the other end. But then when you do it, you're out of the trout tracks. It's slipperier on the inside when you get down here. And have a look at Feeney. That's all about visibility. That's the reason why he's poked the nose there. So 0.2 of a second officially is the margin waters over Van Gisbergen. 0.8 of a second from Waters to Feeney. And we're focused here on Courtney and Mostert. Those guys battling for sixth and seventh. Good gains by Brody Kostecki and Mark Winterbottom. Both of them are two and three spots up. So those are the two cars that just went through your shot there. James Golding's also done a very nice job. He's up three positions. So there's the field for you. And you'll start to see some divergent lines. The problem that you have when you start to be a pioneer and go out wide or do a, a different line. Here we go, he got the inside. Can he get the nose of it, my aid? No. I thought he was going to try to force his way down the inside as you go over the brow for seven and eight. Great skill. Great delicate touch. We're looking at top class operators, as Mark described before, and there's nothing between the top four. And Waters is the pioneer that Mark described a moment ago, and he's slipping and sliding everywhere, and now Van Gisbergen tries to round him up in another direction. Runs wide in the process. He may lose a spot to his teammate, and he has. Brock Feeney jumps up one spot in the process. That move around the outside, you end up getting the painted kerb, Neil. And as soon as it burst into wheel spin, it almost made it into the grass. So a significant error at that point there for Van Gisberg, and he's going to try to sneak his way back down the inside of his young teammate. And Brock is using classic wide go-kart lines at the moment, searching for anything on the track that resembles grip. That's Will Davison. It's all going on out there at the moment. James Courtney's gone faster in Sector 1 than anybody else. James Golding fastest in Sector 2. 
on this lap. Here comes Will down the inside of Boston, who looks like he's battling for grip at the moment, running wide, Will Brown. But gathers it up, doesn't get onto the grass. If you do run on right now with the amount of water out there, it'll be very difficult to get back on. Will's going to get down the inside here. So, Waters, 0.5 up on Feeney. There's a little bit of a spread in this part of the pack. What an awesome shot. <laughs> Where do you break? Fantastic. How do you sort it out down here at the end of the straight? And every time you put your foot on the brake at the bottom of a high-speed straight like that, all four corners of the car are snatching under brakes. You're locking the front temporarily, and then you release the brake pedal, and then you're locking the rears, and then you lock the fronts again, and then you lock the rears. You literally wrestle the car all the way into the corner. 100%. And it's total skill. It's unbelievably innate. Every factor, all the steering weight, through the seat of your pants, through every single part. Oh, and even, oh, he's oh, off, oh, he's gone. He's gone, and he's yeah. taken him with him. So, he, and is he going to bog this thing? Does he get out? So off Feeney the road off. also for Feeney. So there's action everywhere out there at the moment. Will Davison has gone off. Brock Feeney has gone off. And that's the margin, first, second and third. So it is still Waters, Van Gisbergen and Di Pasquale. What a race and trouble for the I MSR see, cars. The truck Jack. assist cars have got together at six. Looks like there's something on the road down there. Everybody off the road at that, at that zone. Fastest car on the track is James Goldie. He's one second faster than the leaders on the last lap. Hazelwood said he took out LeBrock on the radio a moment ago. What a race. So, <laughs> 0 0.2 of a second is the official margin between these two, between Waters and Van Gisbergen. And what skill. Dancing these cars off their fingertips and driving in the wet in these conditions is not about physicality, it's about mental capacity. And when you get to the end of these races, particularly the long ones in these sorts of wet conditions, you are mentally destroyed. Totally. Because the difficulty involved in trying to sense everything that Mark was talking about, Jordan Boys off the road, one of the wild cards between 14 and 15. Brought up what little dust there is around the edges. LeBrock off one more time. This gives us an indication of how crazy slippery it is out there at the moment. And Cam Waters has been the guy at the front for the majority of this event. Has had to lead the way. And that is immensely hard. You don't know how much grip you've got. As I said before, using all your sensory perception to try to understand what goes on and how much grip you've got. See what Shane did then. He lent on the front tyre, completely clear of the throttle at turn three. And he was actually, oh, how's the amount of water on the screen? And how slippery that thing looks at turn five. So he snow ploughed those front tyres through three. And he's also searching high and low at the moment to try and get some visibility. And he's in search of grip. Actually, let's just wind this up. Oh, 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 oh. Shane. Wind this up and enjoy it, folks, because this is supreme. second time penalty to car 25 for a driving infringement. Whoa! Did he get him? He did. We're enjoying the onboard, but we need to get back to the description here because another change. In the meantime, there was a penalty in the background for Chaz Mostert. So how slippery was that thing out there? Watching over the left shoulder of Van Gisbergen. Waters is not done. He's going to get back down the inside. This is unbelievably great motor racing between these guys. There is nothing in it. The drivers are matched. The cars are matched. And Deep Pasquale's in this as well. Three cars, three different drivers, three different engineering and performance groups, different performance levels typically across these groups. And look at how close these cars are. They are maximised at the moment. Just trying to drive it now, Van Gisbergen, in the wheel track of the car in front. He chose not to fire down the inside. That's what he just did. Instead of going down the inside on the, on the part of the road that didn't have any grip, he drove it in the wheel tracks, and he came come onto the straight better than Cam Waters. Lost it in, and he'll take that stop early because the earlier he takes it, the less impact the 15 seconds has. Exchange continues now through two and three. Waters is up the inside of Van Gisbergen. This is an epic motor race. 
absolutely nothing between them. They're searching high and low for grip. Either one of these guys in the lead blinks, then Anton's going to grab the lead. So they'll make the change now for the wheels and tyres on this car, and then they've got to hold him for 15 seconds in accordance with those rules. Waters on top one more time. This is one of the best wet weather motor races I've ever seen. Unbelievable well, skill. 13, 14, and this battle, 15, no, 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 no. Van Gisbergen and Waters especially, the race craft and the respect that they've shown, they've not made contact, given each other racing room. And all three of them, regardless of whether they end up first, second or third or somewhere else, they'll revel in this. They'll talk about it afterwards. That was so much fun. They're in front of their cars. They're on top of their cars. They know and understand them. They can feel everything in all four corners constantly. They've worked out the grip levels now. We got a report a moment ago from Garth Panda that it's even wetter down there. It's been raining harder. But these guys are now completely in tune with what's going on. So it is maximum attack. And don't discount James Courtney. He's only 3.2 seconds from the lead. And you'll see glimpses of him in the background. So anybody spills it in the first group, and he'll be right there as well. James Golding up six positions. A little while ago, he was a second faster than the front guys. In fact, his fastest time is a 9-9. It's better than Cam Waters with a 10 dead. Will Brown's done the fastest lap of the race with a 9.08. He's back in fifth. So don't just count him either. After an excursion. Yeah. And the bonus points still apply. It doesn't matter about the wet conditions. So at the moment, that would be a provisional additional five points for Will Brown. So it's momentarily brighter out there on that shot as they make their way beneath the overhead sign. This is the OTR Super Sprint. We're at the bend. The third of three races at this location in Tail and Bend this weekend, and the first time, despite the threats earlier, that we've actually got wet conditions. It was forecast to arrive much earlier in the day with the possibility of some pretty wild storms, and it arrived just prior to the race. Now, they're laying up in readiness for Mark Winterbottom down there. We're on top of it with Dizzy Cam. <laughs> Done. Now, the other thing to bear in mind in these conditions, and we saw it last year, that pit lane with the concrete surface by comparison to the racetrack surface is so, so slippery. I wouldn't be surprised to see somebody overshoot or a little error trying to pull up. The fastest car now is Brody Kostecki, so Will Brown's teammate has done an 8 7. That's almost a second faster than Cam Waters in the previous lap. Car 56. Jake Kostecki's got something happening with that car, so a mechanical black fa a flag for that vehicle. Now, this is the other thing. Some people are also going to have the typical vision woes. They no longer have the filament heaters in the screen. It's a polycarbonate screen in these cars. They've got tear-offs on them, and they've got an anti-fog film on the screens as well. But when you're inside these cars and you've got such an incredible amount of temperature coming from underneath the floor of the car and the firewall and the exhaust system. You've got the transaxle in behind. There's heat everywhere. You can't make horsepower without making heat. So often, and this car doesn't actually look too bad, but often you'll get into different cars in these conditions and it's like staring out from the inside of a fish shop window. It's just <laughs> wet and horrible. You can't see anything. Yeah, very true. Um, David Reynolds up 13 positions too. I didn't say that before when I was going down the totem cuff. Given the lateness of how this rain came, a lot of the teams wouldn't have had time to get the wipes onto the inside of those plastic part polycarbonate windscreens. So that's why we're seeing so many cars struggling with vision. Some teams may have predicted the rain and got it on there before they went to the grid. A lot of teams were scrambling while they were out there changing those tyres and getting ready for the rain. And speaking of vision, Zach Best is shown in pit lane right now and they have pulled that car out of the race. The windscreen wiper isn't working. The wiper motor has failed and they've decided to park up Zach Best in these conditions. No wiper, no play. Yeah, smart call. Be very easy to damage five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars worth of race car in these conditions. Now Scott Pye's coming into the pit lane. Fastest lap of the race now belongs to Will Davison at 208.4. They're a long way from those wet, I beg your pardon, the dry lap times that we saw. So this is the new on entry of Scott Pye. There was a little bit of damage on that car in the last one. Check out the wheel spin as he tries to drive that off. Even with the pit lane speed limiter engaged and the 40k limit, it's still hard to walk the car away. And one of the real things about understanding the grip level, because to your point, by now the drivers are up to speed. They've been able to understand where the grip lies, where the 
you run a wide line, a narrow line, wherever the really bad areas of curb usage, for instance, is all important. But when you put a fresh new tyre on the back, it changes completely again. Shane keeps on hunting high and low, up and around. He's searching for grip. He's looking for anything that will give him a turning or drive advantage. So he's going to come up on the outside here in a somewhat awkward position at turn 14. He'll look to undercut, and he does. He tries to stick the nose down here before he gets to 15. So far, so good. The two of them have been oh so close, but there's been no ugly contact. Gentle fanning of the throttle as Cam tries to find traction against that wet tyre. He locked the brake, he's run wide, he locked the inside front, and that's an invitation for Shane. Now, he managed to keep it on the racetrack critically, but we saw it bobble and knew exactly what was going on. You saw that it was ploughing, he released the brake to get the steering back and drops a spot in the process. So what Cam's going to do now, don't go out there. <laughs> he's, this little mistake was one of the ones where Van Gisbergen's been using that tram track. He's been using the tyre track of the car in front. Little mistake there, all of a sudden he has to go out onto the smooth, shiny section, and he was able to get away with it. And when it happens, swear at yourself, because we're only talking a few millimetres too late on the brake and maybe a little bit too much clamping pressure, and it stops that inside front tyre and momentarily makes the car bobble and carts it a metre or two further down the road, and it's all it takes when you're driving at the limit. And that's all it took for Waters to drop that spot, and you're filthy with yourself when it happens. No doubt, absolutely. James Golding's drive, I can't rave enough about it. He's up six spots on the previous lap there, he just did his fastest lap. It's, it's almost dead on what the leaders are doing. So, David Reynolds, man of the match so far, up 15 spots. Slade up 11 spots. Brody Kostecki and Golding both up six positions. 1.2 seconds is the margin now between Van Gisbergen and Waters. It's a two-second blanket across the top three. Shane Van Gisbergen, Waters and Deep Pasquale. Courtney's just dropped off ever so further, Mark. So it's 3.2 seconds now between Anton and James, but it's far from resolved between James and Will Brown. And Brock Feeney's still lurking back there as well. But so far, very few people have taken the opportunity to grab their tyres. The first driver in the queue that has is Mark Winterbottom, and there was a penalty for Chaz Mostert. He's done it as well. And for Scott Pye. So Team 18 have done it early, and they're looking for the benefit of hopefully trying to come through later on a warmer tyre. There won't be much tyre wear out there in these conditions, but you will feather the edge or round the edge of the wet tyre ever so slightly if the dry, well, it's not dry groove, if those tram track grooves remain. And uh, the square edge of the tyre, the sharp edge of the tyre is what delivers the grip. And in the spectrum of wet tyres, the Supercar Dunlop wet tyre is a very hard one and it's had to be over the years because we don't have an intermediate tyre by choice. So it runs across all kinds of racetracks, all sorts of temperatures, all sorts of abrasion levels and it's very hardy. And we've seen particularly at Bathurst how long it's run without having to pull it off the car. But it is a very, very hard wet tyre and it's a real challenge to drive on. And in fact, I'm amazed that the top runners have pushed so hard, so mistake-free for so long. Oh, totally. Yeah, we've been absolutely wowed by their car control and their mastery of these sorts of conditions on this tyre, on this surface, and with no previous wet running at all. Hazelwood off the road, down at the bottom end of the track, leading into turn 12. So there's a fair bit of damage on that one. I heard Todd... I think he was apologising to Jack LeBron, but we didn't really see what the issue was between those two cars, but I did hear him apologising and may have actually run into turn six a little bit too fast. You can see Van Gisbergen now, is, now he's got that visibility. He's actually concentrating. Oh. Big slide there by, by Brown. He gathered it up nicely. It looked like it was going to escape and run off the road, but he had to come right out of the throttle and gather it back up. He lost a little bit of ground compared to Courtney, but it was a nice save. It is slippery out there like you cannot believe, folks. These cars are sprung and damped very stiffly. They've got big anti-roll bars on them as the boys and 
girls have been describing all day. They're set up for these dry conditions that have been evident through the weekend. They're not set for these wet conditions at all. And they've got a pile of horsepower. And it's the worst possible combination out there. A mirror shiny <laughs> racetrack, a stiff car, a pile of horsepower and a hard wet tyre. It's a great day to be a commentator. Yeah. And, and no experience of what the cars might feel like and <laughs> how they're going to react. So again, it just it, all you can rely on is complete natural talent, and they can't do anything for you in the in the garage right now. So all you can do is tune the brake bias, and you can tune the sway bars. And I did see a lot of people that might have disconnected the sway bars before they went into the start of this race. And you can tune your brain. Yeah. So, and meaning that you can search high and low for Jack LeBrock in the garage truck assist racing for Matt Stone Racing. So unfortunately parked up. When I say that, it means that you can alter your technique. You can start to learn to short shift to avoid the wheel spin. You can change your lines, and we've seen evidence of that already, trying to search for grip. Because this is a relatively new racetrack, it doesn't have that gnarly, raspy stuff off the racing line. And whoa, that's not good for Will. Whoa, he's still going. Which way's north? <laughs> Wow, well, so that is not good. Now, where is he seated in things here? Ten. So he's still old. So he's gathered back up and got back on. Have a look at the march from, from Reynolds in particular. It's just been a remarkable drive by David. It was his worst qualifying since 2008 at Phillip Island. So he had a shocking running qualifying. So he's come from the back of the grid. Yeah, so he told me that uh, he had those troubles with the dash and that really hurt the cause. So Macaulay's struggling to see. As Garth explained before that some of the teams didn't get I mean, in different organisations that I've been with over the years, it was mandatory, didn't matter what, unless it looked like it was absolutely zero chance of raining, it was always in the protocol and the pre-race check to make sure that you had the anti-fog going. Let's go to Larco. Trompo as Macaulay Jones just departs there now. So anyone that stops now puts wet tyre on. A little bit of game in town here. I think it's unlikely it's going to dry out. We're a bit past halfway through the race. But look at your radars. Look out the back here, just behind the complex here. It opens up. Right? The crowd's going to go over fairly quickly. Question is, will we get a dry line towards the end of the race? Could you put on a slick for that one stop? Brave. Oh. Don't count it out. Oh, Larko, okay, please. How about Look we... at your radars. Please. Yeah. But don't be fooled. So oh. I mentioned it on the grid. So the surface wind is one thing, but the weather that got delivered in the end actually came from the south. So upper level doing different things. But Larko, if you want to have a crack on a slick, I'll go and grab a car. Yeah. Be my guest. Yeah, exactly. And Gisberg now got 3.7 seconds. <laughs> Shut him down. That's him just. <laughs> Sorry for him now. <laughs> uh, Reynolds, 16 positions. Golding, 6 positions. Brody Kostecki up 7. Tim Slade up 11. Chris Pitha up 7 spots. So, doing some really high quality drives through the field today. David Reynolds, as we said, from the back is currently ninth. Anytime that you can come from the back of this field and get into the top 10 in those conditions, you have driven superbly. Well, it underscores the talent. Yeah. Because one of the things that the wet typically does is that it's a bit more of an equaliser. It's a little less car technical and it favours a little bit more of the driver stuff. And you can see it's still raining over there on that part of the racetrack if Brody and James argue the case. These fellas are battling for fourth and fifth. So Brody's up eight spots as Mark detailed those that have been moving and shaking in this one. That's heavy wet out there. If I miss Deep Pasquale going off, Deep Pasquale was third and he's currently sixth. So we've just looking at those numbers. It's not a timing error, but I, yeah, I reckon he's, he's actually lost three or four spots. There's been a couple of occasions this week where I've been fooled. We can see Anton out there at the moment he has. in the train. Yeah. Uh, where transponders have obviously been faulty and they've not picked up on the timing and then they've reappeared, but we can clearly see him. But you're right, he's not where he was. Shane's now got 4.3 seconds, so he's starting to head off in the distance here and the fresh air's helping him, so he's not in that battle with Cam Waters now. And he's out on his own doing his own thing, but remember, he's yet to stop. So when do they take that stop? We've got 10 laps remaining at the moment. This is what it looks like from Feeney's car. 
there's been numerous cars off the road because David Reynolds has dropped a heap of spots also. Yeah. So's Golding. So there's been a, a bunch of cars off the road on that last lap. I wonder if it was related. Check the viz. How'd you like to stay committed to the throttle? Oh, oh and that's what it is. Right-hand side there for David Reynolds, and it's had a fair nudge at the front as well. So he's actually battling to see too. It's crapping down the road. There's something. It's broken a front steering arm, or you know, something's hanging off it because it's it's looking it's very used. Really it's got that point. used look. <laughs> Second hand. You're saying it's not going to buff out? <laughs> no, I don't reckon it'll buff out. <laughs> it definitely won't. 2.4 seconds. So that margin that I spoke about just flip-flopping a lot between Van Gisbergen and Waters here as well. And uh, slightly exposed into the left-hander at six, James Courtney was up wide. There's puddles everywhere at the moment. It's just momentarily brighter. And depending on where you look, it's heavy black, not so much. And as Mark Larkin pointed out before, in one direction, actually doesn't look too bad at all. So down the inside comes Brody. Yep. On James Courtney. Passes down the inside quite nicely. That one was nice and uneventful, which when you're in a wet race like this is exactly what you want as a driver. Di Pasquale, followed by Courtney, followed by Feeney now up the inside. I'll tell you what's weird is Mostert is actually the first car that's pitted now. So with a 15 second penalty, he's gone and passed Mark Winterbottom. Football rain. Seems to be a lot more apple planning now. See, that was James in the background. We're still seeing raindrops on the... And that's what happens. There's rain, there's rain, there's rain. We've got to try and hang out at the end of the race. Just put the stop on the end of the race. Yeah. So James actually probably telling us what we needed to know. He feels like there's more aquaplaning. So I reckon it's a little bit what Larko was alluding to before. You'd be fooled into thinking because the light levels are changing and it does look clear off in one direction that things might be getting better, but the track's not saying that at all at the moment. As a uh, knockometer, high tech knockometer ready to be deployed. Here we go, is the bang. Oh. So that's David fully locked up into the back of James Golding. So that's the mystery. We were trying to work that out before when they'd made so much ground. Oh. Have a look how far off the road they are. And that's just visibility. Yeah. That would just be pure visibility. Wouldn't have been able to see where the car in front was. What a shame for both, because they were both steaming along really nicely. And for young James Golding, who's only in his second event with Peter Gibberis at Premier Hire Racing in the subway car, he was really showing the skills that we know that he's got. And David's out there with a car that's limping. It's got steering damage. It's got front end damage. And... Uh, looks profoundly evil to drive. Look, look at how much right hand down it is trying to get it into pit lane. So it's, it's got half a turn of lock. As it crabs down pit lane at 40k, it's got half a turn of steering lock to drive it straight. So have a look how misaligned the front wheels are with the rear wheels. So now significant slow down, slow comment. Down, slow down. Okay, Dave, we're going to hold you here until we fix the damage. Okay, no, no, sorry, we can't send it. We're not allowed to send it. Uh, so, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's too damaged. Yeah, that's over and out. Meantime, the battle continues on the left side of screen. Okay, Gisbergen's got a five-second margin now over Waters. Brody Kostecki's fought his way onto the podium, and the battle continues here with Anton, who early in the race really had his hands full trying to get that car to hook up and then looked a bit stronger, but I've been looking around in all directions and listening to other comms. You didn't get to the bottom of what happened with Anton? No, no, no. So he was running third, and he went a long way back down to the field. And that's Shane coming up now to lap Hazelwood. Completely sidesteps, so Todd just gets well and truly out of the way. And that's what you're saying. So on that end of the track, it actually looks really nice and clear, doesn't it? That's where Larko's Bow Desert view comes from. Oh, that's, that's what Larko was trying to sell to us. Which was 
good. He was trying yeah. to sell the, the possibility of the energy, but I reckon the dry track could be about Wednesday, 4 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a bit late for this. <laughs> 5.2 seconds is the margin between Van Gisbergen and Waters. <laughs> Might be a bit harsh. <laughs> but, uh, this has been a very, very strong performance. From Brody Kostecki today, you've really got to applaud the climb back up through the field here. He just has not relented. And remember his drive at Sandown, uh, where he got his first podium in wet conditions. It was a masterful performance on that day. So lost it uh, down in 15th position after that stop that you spoke about. And he is actually still the first car in the field that's taken tyres and how far away is he? He's one minute and 13 20. seconds. I beg your pardon, one minute and 20 seconds. Misalign those lines. So uh, he's a long way, a long way down. So we've got a 38 second transit through the lane plus the wheels and tyres. So it's a big job. But he came in at a similar time to Frosty. He's actually put almost six seconds on Mark Winterbottom with a 15 second deficit from the pit lane. And getting in and out of the pit lane clearly in these conditions is, is a bit slower getting in and out and getting things back up to speed as well. So the transit time, we actually don't know properly yet. It won't be 38 seconds. No. no. Have a look at the screen. This wow. is what you get from the local amp hole there, Neil. You just grab one of those when you're doing your screen next time. <laughs> Gee whiz. That's not good. So I just as in the, went into the Red Bull garage and had a look, and they've actually got the LED pit board out. And that's for Shane Van Gisbergen, because the radio communication or the quality of the radio is not real great. If you remember early in the weekend in practice, he actually changed his whole helmet because the radio wasn't that good. So although you've got all this rain out there, that's probably the best pit board you can use because it lights up beautifully. They've got it just as a backup. They think the radio is good enough that he'll hear when he needs to pit, but they want to have that just in case. Thanks for the update, Garth. So they're running him long. In fact, there's a bunch of them running long here. They're, they're making a lie of the notion that I talked up before about having to deal with a cold tyre at the back end of the race, but clearly there's a heap of them that are comfortable to do that. And if you're changing rears over, you've got a thing under your right foot that helps excite the temperature and the pressure. Yeah, it's pretty much up to the driver, isn't it? Yeah, Courtney in, done, and back out one more time. Now, I think we've actually got to the bottom of the Deep Squally off hearing that it was down at the hairpin and this is on board so he comes through the fast left-hander tries to get it stopped those wheel tracks are now gone and he's gone so where he went to turn in there were originally wheel tracks there then it just become complete ice looking is that courtney also so they all went off down there didn't they there was three or four cars was that turn six yeah, yeah. into turn six yeah, yeah. Yeah, that uh, look, maybe there was something on the road down there. It might have been momentarily wetter or somebody carted some junk onto the road. But that one was a bit weird, wasn't it? So that explains it. And that uh, gives us a precise understanding of why he suddenly dropped out of contention. He's sitting in sixth at the moment. But the march forward by Erebus generally is continuing. Remembering that Will Brown was off the road at one stage, which we called. He's back up into fourth position there at the moment. And what it's going to do near the back end uh, and teammates like, for example, Kostecki and Brown are going to have to sort out when they stop. 96, loose items in the cab. Loose <laughs> items in the cabin. Mechanical black flag, 96. <laughs> so loose items in the cabin, and that doesn't mean the driver, is uh, for the squeegee for Macaulay Jones. <laughs> uh, boys, I'm just going to get out of the sun here because I'm going to get sunburnt, so I'll just stand over here. Um, loose items in the cab. <laughs> Remember Shane Van Gisbergen did that a couple of years ago at uh, Bathurst, and I recall they banned being able to do that back then. So I'm surprised that team didn't pick up on it. Now, yeah, okay, I overstepped the mark, thinking the track's going to dry out. I'll cop that one. But look at the, the skies opening up around here. Okay, so my point probably was, if I can just withdraw a little bit was think about putting on tyres late in the race. You might put a completely different tyre pressure on and put yourself in a much better position. Thank you for support, guys. <laughs> Which way's north, like eh? Huh? Nothing? That was good. But the good thing yeah. was that he was throwing up the possibility that there, there could be some influence on the track behaviour and the different weather conditions. So you get a little badge on his sleeve 
Bradley's arguing the case with Paul Martin about the loose items in the cabin. I had one in a 24-hour race at Pampas many years ago. We had one of those things on the stick, and it ended up on the feet. A bit uh, hard to get it from down no, there. No, no good. So it is brighter out there, and Larko's 100% right, but those track conditions, they've, they've barely improved at the moment. There's not much going on lap speed-wise, but we've got an 8.8-second margin over Cam Waters between Shane and Cam, and then Brody's about 5.6 behind, so things have just stabilised here at the moment. Let's get back into the lane. And just on this Macaulay Jones uh, topic of discussion, we saw Bradley in pit lane having a pretty heated discussion with the supercars officials. I believe it's over the fact that they are saying that the squidgy has been Velcroed to the cabin inside the car. So their argument is it's not loose, it's Velcroed on. Oh, <laughs> oh Brad. We had to try to sell that concept. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be like telling you that you could get onto a slick tyre at the back end of this race. Now... We've been raving about the early job with Brody Kostecki and Will Brown and previously David Reynolds and James Golding. But I reckon one of the drives of the race so far is actually Chas Mostert. Mostert has just passed James Courtney with the 15-second penalty. Yeah, so there's underlying pace in the car. Anton Di Pasquale's come in, by the way. Here he is. Down race for him this afternoon, but there's still some pace in that car. So now we've only got five laps to go. There's a heap of people to process their stops. Yeah, it's going to get busy, isn't it? It's going to get very busy. Okay, so we're going to stand by for this. All look pretty neat. You can see as the car pulled up, the negative camber on those front wheels on Anton's car, which if it was heavy wet like this in ideal circumstances, you'd want to knock a little bit of that camber off the front of it and stand up and get a little bit better braking and potentially even tyre performance because there isn't the same level of tyre distortion because the load's not going through the tyre. So here is Mostert making the ground that Mark spoke about just a few moments ago on James Courtney at turn six. And that's where we think that Anton went off a little bit earlier on the replays. The Bunnings trade power pass and Mostert beautifully down the inside now. He benefits, uh, benefits here from that early stop. He got a lot of warmth in those tyres. He'd be well and truly in the groove. Things might be getting just a little bit better out there because Brody's actually just gone quicker in Sector 1 than anybody else. And all the drivers in the top four so far have just done personal bests in the mid-sector. So uh, hang on, it'll be sunscreen any tick of the clock, Larko. <laughs> 100 percent yeah. mate, I had to come in out of the sun. I'm gonna get sunburned. Now listen, let's have a look at Anton's left rear tire. This just came off the car, so this is the working tire. And Coppe talking earlier. See there, you just see a little bit of radius on the edge of that that mould there, so that needs to cut really hard. So that won't cut as well. Still plenty to pump water through there. I'm interested in the temperature. That's probably, I'm guessing, 30 degrees centigrade. Remember, these will run at about 80 to 100, 110 in the dry. So that's got a little bit of warmth in it, but not a lot. While you were explaining the left-hand rear, Anton was having his very, very best absolute out-of-control moment. He had a full tank slapper going out at turn 12. Wow. Yeah, so... He couldn't uh, find the centre of the steering. It was sliding, and then it, it, it caught the front wheels and it went the other way. And it's still... So what he's doing is exactly what you said, just exciting the rear. Check this out. So he gasses it, and it's, it's bolted sideways. He catches the slippery kerb. Have a look how sideways that is. Then it follows the front wheels. Then he's doing his best Ari Barton and <laughs> impression. What's this? What's this? I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> He got that on the lock stops then. It was. So he was out of steering travel and uh, hopefully it was going to bite and it did. So when Tyco was describing the temperature in the left rear of the garage, Anton was also describing the temperature and the behaviour of his left rear at the time. And it was a bit exciting. <laughs> wow, cool stuff. Now Waters is pressing on with some speed here at the moment. He's gone faster in sector one. He's 8.3 seconds behind Van Gisbergen. Shane responding as we pick him up on the feed here in the middle of the racetrack faster than anybody else and his cumulative should be better. The fastest lap of the race actually belongs to Brody Kostecki at the moment in third position. He's looking pretty safe. He's 6.1 clear of his teammate Will Brown who's five odd seconds clear of Brock Feeney. 
but Brock is only barely clear of Will Davison at the moment, who, despite the rotation, is still in the game and earning good points. Marco. Crompo, we talk endlessly, don't we, about the importance of tyre temperature. And just to go to your comments there about Anton, what a great example, ambient temperature, 15 degree tyre, say, on the car, 12 degrees, whatever, versus 30 degrees, day and night. Great example of it. Yeah, he, uh, and he used a lot of skill in that catch that we saw on the replay, Mark. He had the whole thing going. It looked like it aquaplaned across. He was a bit wide. It aquaplaned across the top of the water. It was a cold rear tyre. And then he had everything going in full opposite left lock. Got onto the steering lock. They don't have a lot of lock like a road car, these vehicles. There is Brody, And there's the margin back to his teammate, Will Brown. So that's third and fourth. Here's the gap back to Brock. Brock sitting in fifth position. And then you can see Will Davison stalking him at the moment, despite having rotated earlier. And then in behind these guys, we've got Lee Holtzworth and Nick Perkat. And Todd Hazelwood just getting out of the way. He's not in contention there at the moment. Um, Charles Golden, I beg your pardon, Mark, is in position in, in ninth. Still a fine performance, all things considered for him. Tim Slade, 10th. Go ahead. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's a, a good recovery after being fired off the road down there at turn six. The other guy that's done a really nice job is Tim Slade. I think he's up like 14 spots. So very nice plod through the field because these sorts of conditions, you spoke about it on the opening lap, no visibility, trying to just get to the end of one of these events without running into the car in front is hard enough. So a beautiful execution. There'll be something in all of this for Tim and those fellows at Cool Drive to unpack and learn about what's going on with their car because for it to be battling as much in the dry as it is for Brendan Hogan, for Matt Nilsson, and when he's with us and he's a bit unwell at the moment, so a shout out to Mirko De Rosa who normally engineers that car. There's something underlying that they haven't got quite right at the moment. It's shining in the wet, but it's not showing so much in the dry conditions. And sometimes that can give you a little bit of a clue as to yep. trying to figure out what you need to do to smarten it up. Now they're laying up at the Red Bull Ampole Racing Team in preparation and drivers will be warned about how slippery the conditions are in that pit lane. They've left it so, so late. There's two laps remaining and there's a heap of people. 11 cars in my reckoning and damage on the front of the midis entry for Bryce Forward. 11 cars in my reckoning that haven't taken their compulsory stop and Mostert on a lap here at the moment that could give him the fastest lap. And he again, is about to round up Anton Di Pasquale. I can't rave about this enough. The, the job he's done with a 15-second penalty. And can you re remember the wet drive at Sydney Motorsport Park? Oh, extraordinary. Yeah, absolutely. What a shame that he hasn't been in this battle today. I don't I can find a memory issue, but I don't recall exactly what he did early on to earn the penalty either. Uh, it was a driving infringement early. He had contact with another Chas Mostert early. I don't know who he bumped. No, but I'm just wondering yeah. who it was. I yeah. knew he bumped someone. That yeah. was the penalty. I was at will. Right. <laughs> All right, so Will Brown, Brock Thing, Lee Holtzworth, James Golding, in, out, done. The other guy that's done a great job, Cropo, is Jordan Hoyes as a wild card. He uh, hasn't really settled yet because he hasn't done the stop. But he was up almost 10 spots, so that's a, that's a nice job as a wild card. Inexperienced, 20 years of age. And he's been able to get through very nicely. Brock Feeney battling to stop it then and get it to the first corner, wasn't he? Wow. Yeah, so this is the other challenge now when you go out there on a stone cold rear tyre that uh, this next couple of laps is going to be pretty hard work because they won't they won't actually balance up by the time you get to the chequered flag but it's going to depend on uh, who you're around as to whether or not that's any big deal but will davison now on target to potentially get the fastest lap he's gone faster in sector one than anybody else so wild right here for jake sticky rotates it this might make defense it's so far off the road lucky it spun so violently because it looked like it was going to make those tyres off the back there. Here's the leader. So as he goes out now, just the one lap remaining. And he's got Waters and Stecky going to do the same thing. Will Davison is going to do exactly the same thing. So in they march. Van Gisberg, Waters, Kostecki from first, second and third in the race. Go 
speed wasn't it and nice looking stop there for Tickford as well there's yeah, been pretty evil cars out there for the next lap mark it certainly will be but as you said at least when you're in the driver's seat and you you pressure those rear tires up massively which is only going to do a very short period of time on the car and as the driver you can burst them into wheel spin and excite them which generates a fair bit of temperature reasonably quickly it doesn't happen immediately so it's 7.8 seconds between this man on screen here, Shane Van Gisbergen and Cam Waters. And uh, the word came through that that was Mostert and Will Davison at turn six where the aggravation was earlier on while we were looking every which way. So this guy's going to do it again. And you know the crazy thing? I'm looking at the fastest lap in the race and guess whose name's alongside it at the moment. Yeah, exactly. Shane Van Gisbergen. So that means potentially 15 bonus points this weekend. And uh, it's just been an extraordinary performance from him and the team, everybody associated. It's not a one-man show inside these outfits. This is still being disputed, though. These fellas are arguing over fifth and sixth, Will Brown and Brock Feeney. Turn six. They just barely pull them up down there. And it's a long, long, long wait before you get to the very late apex down there. And Brock looking to try and round him up in the process. So the margins here, and really there's big chunks of time between Van Gisbergen, Waters, Kostecki, Davison. So this is the battle. This is probably the only one, certainly in the top 10 that I can see at the moment, that's likely to change anything. Although Percat's come up pretty solidly as well in behind his teammate Chas Moss, that they're very close. But Van Gisbergen has done a mighty job again in the back half of the race. But that battle that we witnessed early in the race that involved the three of them together with Cam Waters and Anton Di Pasquale, that was worth the price of admission. It was beautiful execution driving these race cars. Out of the final corner for the last time this weekend, and he's done it three times in a row at the bend. Well done, Shane Van Gisbergen. Beautiful drive, 8.7 seconds in the end. So a podium for Waters after trying very hard the first couple of races here this weekend. He converts. Brody Kostecki, dip your hat to that drive, Mark. He's come up massively to be able to get himself onto the podium. Ten spots to get that job done. Absolutely. Superb performance. We saw him last year at Sandown. Now Brock got there. Yeah, got, on Brown. Yeah. yeah. So Davison, Brock Feeney, Will Brown, out to Di Pasquale. Now Shane cuts loose. Now they're getting some temperature. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Superb. And men and women at Red Bull Ampol Racing Team celebrating that performance. So, fine job today. They've done an outstanding job with him this weekend. Didn't look that convincing right at the very beginning, and he was critical of his own driving performance, Shane. Said the car was awesome in the race, but when he was trying to push it for those quick single laps early in the weekend yesterday, it wasn't nice. This is what the Craftsman looks like when you're winding it sideways everywhere. And that's a smile in those eyes. It so certainly it's is, been isn't a it? very yeah. profitable weekend for him, hasn't it? So we've been talking about the fact that at Tickford and at Dick Johnson Racing, they've been throwing punches back in the other direction. They've clearly got some one lap pace because they've been able to steal a lot of those armor or poles away from these guys. But the race performance of this fellow has just been superlative. He just, he's not making mistakes and he's finding that extra little bit of margin. And uh, that situational awareness that he and the others were displaying in the early part of this race, Mark, that's the real takeout for me, that they could all race each other in next to no visibility. And they were alongside, behind, left, right, up, down. And I might be wrong, but I don't reckon they even exchanged any paint. Yeah, um, I made the comment at the time. I thought that no contact at, at that, any point there. Beautiful drive between 
Champion Gisbergen and Cam Waters, that was a great battle early. And as soon as he got clear, he was able to just escape, wasn't he? Yeah, as soon as yeah. he had fresh air, it made an enormous difference. So there's the margins for you. It was just a little under nine seconds in the final analysis. Van Gisbergen over Waters. Brody Kostecki up 10 spots to get on the podium. And despite a gyration, Will Davison getting back to fourth position. That was mighty. And the other one for me that was a big takeout there was the way in which Mostert came back from a penalty contact and a penalty early on that involved 15 second orange break yeah. in the middle of the race. So uh, for him to be able to get back and do that, that was pretty impressive. So they parked up Jack LeBrock with damage. Zach Best had a wiper fail on that car. And Shane trying to wipe out the pit lane entry on the way in here. <laughs> After gathering another 105 points. So beautiful work. So uh, a couple of interesting takeouts also. Performance-wise, James Golding, worth noting, folks, yep. in the background yep. that when things click in his direction, we're probably going to see more of that young man. So the Pertec victory lane belongs to Shane. What a weekend. Three from three. Not often done in this business. And he's been able to capitalise. We talk about round points because the teams, that's how they assess their performance. You can't get any better than three wins and three fastest laps. So that's complete maximum point haul. And, and the interesting thing for me is that they they won't be happy to do it because it's the wrong description, it's the wrong phrase. But, but whatever they do in the way they set up to go racing each weekend, pole positions are not proving to be the thing that they're necessarily after because in the end there's no points for that. It's not contributing to the championship. Others are earning those awards, but Shane's earning the race wins and he's got the championship lead by a hefty margin, isn't he? Yeah. So look at those conditions there. So it caved in just prior to the race start. Think about what it's like out there in those mirror shiny conditions with a tonne and a half of supercar and racing at somewhere over 250 kilometres an hour. Supreme skills today and very well done by Shane Van Gisbergen, who's with Jess. Well, he's dominated per tech victory lane here this weekend. The racing room and respect out there between you and Cameron Waters this afternoon was inspiring. How much fun were you having? Oh, that was awesome. It's always good, you know, racing someone who's got nothing to lose and he drives hard and but respectful as well. Um, yeah, it was awesome. But once I got in front, I struggled a bit with no train tracks to follow and then um, pulled away. So, but what an awesome weekend. Can't thank the team enough. I've struggled with feeling in the car all weekend, but it's been super fast. So I have to thank these guys because I've been struggling. But man, it was, it was an awesome weekend. Just talk to us about how treacherous the conditions were yeah. out there, how hard the visibility was as you were trying to follow, and how you had yeah. to just be patient and wait for Cam to maybe make a mistake. Yeah, well, it was interesting because I had more grip when I was behind. And as soon as I got in front and I lost the train tracks, it was so hard to know what I had. Um, but yeah, the car was really good. I lacked a bit of front, but I had mega rear, so it sort of made up for it. But. Yeah, I'm sort of speechless. Like, I didn't expect to go that well here this weekend, so thanks so much to the team. Perfect points all. Congratulations. Thank you. Cheers. We'll grab a chat now with Cameron Waters, who did a supreme job out there this afternoon. He certainly earned his money. Cam, congratulations. We loved everything at the exchange between you and Shane Van Gisberg, and just talk us through it. Uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun at the start. Um, yeah, cool battle with Shane, and, and I think it was Anton in one of the shell cars, so... It's really cool. I knew he was a little bit quicker, but I just had to try and stay in front of him. And then, um, yeah, I just braked off the off the uh, drive bit on the wet bit and walked up and let him through. And then yeah, he's just a bit quicker. And then, yeah, my screen fogged up, so I was just trying to get it home. Just talk to us about that mistake and how hard it is and how challenging it can be when you've got a guy like Shane Van Giesbergen stalking you all over the back of you. I don't really care who's behind me, to be honest, but um, it's cool that when you can race Shane like that and, you know, he's going to have a crack all the time and, you know, you give it back to him and he loves it and, uh, yeah, just had a lot of fun then. Just spewing I made that mistake, but, um, yeah, the, the screen fogged up anyway, so I was probably a bit wounded, but that's all right. He was a bit quicker. He deserved it. Well done on the performance this afternoon. We loved it. Thanks. And Brody Kostecki on the podium for the second time in season 2022. The team erupted. Yeah, congratulations. How does it feel to be back here on the podium? Yeah, it feels great. You know, um, it feels like an eternity to the last time I had one. So it was great to, um, you know, get one for the whole team. And, um, yeah, we've had really good car pace in the drive, but unfortunately we weren't really able to turn the tyre on in quality. So it's great to repay the whole team with a... Um, podium to finish off the weekend. It's definitely a lot better than, um, you know, where we've been running the last two races. So, yeah, it's bloody awesome. Talk to us about the conditions out there this afternoon and what you learnt. Yeah, I was, um, I was, you know, when the rain came, I just um, started sort of rubbing my fingers together. So, um, 
I uh, love the rain and um, the car was actually quite good in the rain as well, which was um, kind of a surprise. So, um, yeah, the guys did a great job on the pit stop and um, George did a really good job of managing me out there and um, making sure I didn't run off too many times. I had a few off, so sorry, George. But, um, yeah, um, yeah, it was just a great race and, um, yeah, everything went together pretty smoothly. Congratulations, Brady. Enjoy the celebrations. Thank you, I will. Will Brown just down here celebrating Brody Kostecki's podium, but a seventh and a sixth for you today, Will. Nice rebound for the team this weekend. The results weren't there the last couple of events, but this has been a strong one. Yeah, definitely. We should have got a good result yesterday, but uh, just a small penalty put us back. But uh, to get two top tens today and be quite competitive was great. We were, we were good when it was really wet and uh, felt pretty strong, but just uh, lacked a little bit in the end there. But I think anyone that stayed on the black stuff then was doing all right. It was pretty bloody slippery out there. How hard was it to predict how grip, much grip or how little grip you had right at the start. No practice in the wet. You had no idea what you were going into. Yeah, I'm not sure. You used to go in front or the brake markers or something. I wasn't uh, too sure when to brake. But, uh, yeah, you just eased on the brakes ever so slightly and then you'd lock a front and you'd be off. So I think there was a lot of people have a few offs. But uh, bloody exciting race. I hope everyone on TV enjoyed it because it, uh, it was awesome fun out there. We loved it, Will. Hope you did too. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Thank you. Tim Slade, hell of a drive. Started in 26th place, up 15 positions into 11th and you've half the cars missing somewhere out on the track there. How much fun was that out there? Yeah, it was a big shark bite out of the, out of the back. Um, yeah, it, it was good, you know, we, we struggled massively all weekend, so I was, um, yeah, I, I was happy for it to rain just to see if we could uh, have a little bit of pace in, in those conditions. And yeah, the, the car was, uh, was not too bad. Um, yeah, there was a bit of a hit even before the, the race started, a, a concertina at the, the second last corner and then got, got nailed down at turn six. But, you know, that, that's super tricky down there in these conditions. It's just like ice, you know, you touch a brake pedal and it just locks the front solid. So, um, yeah, it, it was fun. It was nice to, um, I guess, be able to have a little bit of input as a driver to, um, to manipulate what the car does as opposed to the, the dry conditions. Certainly was entertaining for us. I'll let you uh, go and rest up. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So the situation now in our points tally. We've completed 23 races of 34 so far in our 22 championship season. How's that margin? It's out to 393, but there's been some changes. So Cam Waters has now moved up into second spot. Anton's dropped the spot based on what happened. And looking further afield, Brody Kostecki's come up into eighth position there after that storming drive onto the podium today, the first one since Sydney Motorsport Park earlier in the year. And Andre Heimgartner, obviously, is a very sad weekend for them because of the damage on that car. He's dropped the spot back into uh, nine position. So this is what it means in terms of the team's championship and you can see the margin there between the Red Bull Ampole Racing Team and the Shell V-Power Racing Team. So it's still a very tight battle between those guys and that'll rage all the way to the end of the championship season and it matters because the position in the garages is a big deal. BP Ultimate Supercars.com. Ultimate Performer we'd love to hear from you. There's a lot of things to talk about this weekend. There's been some superlative drives. I think anybody, regardless of who you barrack for, would have to suggest that those top three guys that we watched in the first part of this race today did an outstanding job between them. So we want to hear from you and let us know what your thoughts are. Jump onto supercars.com and have a look on the website. All right, let's get down to the podium and celebrate this one. It's time for the podium for race 23 of the Repco Supercars Championship at the OTR Super Sprint. In third place for Boost Mobile Racing powered by Erebus, here's Brody Kostecki. In second place for Monster Energy Racing, here's Cameron Waters. From today's winning team, Joel Horsfall. And what a sweep of the weekend it's been once again. Shane Van Gisbergen is the winner for Red Bull and Pole Racing. Presenting today's third place trophy from OTR is Kim Russell. Presenting today's second place trophy, also from OTR, is Default Deploy. <laughs> to the team's trophy from Coca Cola is Lyndon Hunter. And presenting our first place trophy to Shane Van Gisbergen is Kim Russell from OTR.
Ladies and gentlemen, your race 23 OTR Super Sprint Podium. It's time for the celebrations. We'll see you in December, South Australia. Well done to the boys. Fantastic work for Shane Van Gisbergen, and for Cam Waters and for Brody Kostecki. Looking back through recent events, Waters has been on the podium in WA, Winton, Northern Territory, Townsville, and he was searching for a podium this weekend, and he got it, and a big breakthrough there for Brody as well. I think the last one for him was the second place for him, race two at Sydney Motorsport Park earlier in the year, so that'll be a welcome return to form. Boost Mobile highlights now for our final race of the weekend at Tail and Bend. Started under the BP Ultimate Safety Car in a mirror, shiny, wet and greasy racetrack. They did a couple of siding laps, which was actually part of the active race. And then we got some green conditions and off we went. And it was one heck of a battle up front. It, at times, was genuinely extraordinary. We had two and three cars wide constantly and an exchange going on between Cam Waters, between Shane Van Gisberg and Anton Di Pasquale. Brock Feeney was getting there on occasion as well. They crisscrossed up, down, in and around, front, back, sides, every direction. And it was fantastic motorsport, very enjoyable. Ultimately, though, a little mistake by Cam Waters, and that was enough to change the complexion of the race. Eventually, once Shane was able to clear, and he got some fresh air going around that car, but off he went into the distance. And you can see, even late in the race, when it started to get a little bit better in terms of the drier grooves, not dry, but drier grooves, it was still pretty wild out there. So an outstanding performance for Van Gisberg, and he's marching away with the championship.